Hello, I'm Brendan Thomas. And I'm Beth Harwood. Our top stories today. Dangerous buildings in the city. Just how many are there? These rescue ponies could soon be homeless again. Three years after the Grenfell fire, it's still unclear how many buildings in Liverpool are a fire risk. According to the City Council, they're working with just three developers to begin the removal of dangerous cladding from apartment blocks. Figures somewhat at odds with the picture the government is painting. With more details, here's our environmental correspondent, Rory Walsh. Those living in high-rise apartments in the city live in fear. In addition, they've seen their homes rendered worthless. Now they just want someone to take responsibility. While the City Council says it's working with only three developers, more than 50 local applications have been made to the government fund launched in May to tackle the issue. Now, according to the campaign groups, the government is refusing to reveal the true number of affected premises in Merseyside. They claim there is no data for all of the, the buildings nationally, and they said even if they had that information, they couldn't disclose it in regards to data protection, which we just think is ridiculous. So my feeling is they're really not aware. I don't think they want to be aware of the, the total scale of the problem. But we do think there's 700,000 buildings possibly affected throughout the country. Joining us now is Rory Walsh. So Rory, how accurate are the figures that we have on the number of buildings affected in the city? Well, there's just no real way to know. Um, there is a very large discrepancy between the council's figures of just only the three properties and the 50 that have, have applied for the building uh, safety fund since May. Um, on top of this, there's no real evidence that the central government have made an investigation as to where the cladding has gone and how much of it has been sold. So is it still possible that people are living in flats or apartments in the city still unaware of any issues? Uh, very much so. Uh, there's new people coming forward all the time. And as this building safety fund is only, uh, applications are only available through, through to the end of the year, this does suggest that there will be large problems going forward. Thanks, Thank Rory. You. So we'll be bringing you more on that story as it develops. Now, from town or city to country, Merseyside farmers are being targeted by thieves stealing GPS tracking systems from their tractors. The latest spate of rural thefts is causing thousands of pounds worth of losses. Tony Brown has been at a farm in Prescott to find out more. Farmers in Merseyside are worried about the growing rates of theft in the darker months. Recently, they have seen a rise in GPS equipment being stolen, which is worth around £15,000. Ollie Harrison owns a farm in Prescott. He now has to lock his tractors away to try and combat the issue. Well, it's my convenience, uh, an insurance claim which just basically puts your insurance up for the next five years. I mean, we, we have a shed now that was originally built for a grain store, but now it's a machinery store because we have to keep the machinery locked away. So, you know, you, you could potentially say, you know, there's a £70,000 shed there that's, that's, that we're having to use to lock tractors in when really it should be used for storing grain. You know, I mean, I don't know what we'll do next year because I'd like to think we'll have a normal harvest and it will be full of grain, so the tractors will have to live outside again and then every night we'll be have to take all the GPS equipment out. And it, it's a bit like... TV screens, you, you know, you, you don't really want to be unclipping them and moving them and plugging wires into them. You get damaged when you're climbing in and out of steps and stuff. You know, you drop them on the floor. The safest place for them is bolted in the cab, but unfortunately it's not because they're going missing. Ollie Harrison is the Combinable Crops Board Chairman at the National Farmers Union in the North West. They have already set up the Lock It or Lose It campaign in Cumbria due to the theft of quad bikes. Liz Berry from the NFU Northwest is looking to combat theft in Merseyside. We continually work with the different police forces in Lancashire and Merseyside in particular and we've been looking at how we can work together on GPS equipment. We've been looking at um, installing trackers and uh, maybe covert operations. And now time for the COVID roundup with our coronavirus correspondent Izzy Cairns. Mass testing has been underway in Liverpool for over two weeks now, with over 100,000 residents being tested so far. Recent figures have shown a decrease in positive cases over the region, with Liverpool Mayor Joe Anderson saying that he hopes the public's efforts to take part in the testing has earned them a Merry Christmas. Despite the decrease in positive cases, there is still question about what tier the city will be placed in on Thursday. Some business owners have voiced concerns about what the tier system means for them. 
Ross Walker is the General Manager of the Eccleston Arms Hotel and Grill in St Helens, which has been providing free meals for vulnerable people in the area over the pandemic as part of their No One Goes Hungry campaign. If we went into tier three for the first time since the first lockdown, I heard him speak about hotels closing. So we've also, we've, we've been allowed to stay open throughout the entirety of it for business people, which is essential travel work, work that people have to get done. And, you know, we've got a lot of clients now that are new, but are coming back regularly because they have work that needs to get done. That would stop. Um, if we had to, if we had to close the hotel in a tier three situation, that would stop. Um, then it would lead on to the feasibility of having the takeaway open because as we've got the hotel rooms open, it leads to being able to have the takeaway open at the, at the same time because there's someone in the building, you wouldn't necessarily need someone here otherwise. So it, it all helps, it all helps each other out. Tier three changes that. If we're in tier two, great. And you know what? He's changed the, the curfew to 11 p.m. That means that although it's still not great, you get you are still getting that extra hour of not rushing people, having people in. That is nice to recognise that. Um, so we're praying for tier two more than anything, really. Tier two is is is, is, is workable. And now in sport, it has been revealed that up to 4,000 fans will be allowed to watch outdoor events after the lockdown restrictions have lifted on December the 2nd. It is confirmed that this will only apply to areas in tiers 1 and 2 and social distancing measures will still be in place. For those who are going to be at grounds, it's going to be a, a new discipline for them. Um, and um, so, uh, like the players have had to adjust um, you know, with social distancing as players, uh, obviously not in the hurly burly of action, but because of the, the restrictions on fans now, they're going to have to really get used to it. I I'm sure mistakes are going to be made. And uh, so whilst it's great to be in the grounds, it's still not going to be business as usual for them. That's all for your COVID roundup today. Back to Beth and Brendan. Thanks, Izzy. With Boris Johnson pledging a new 10-step green plan to help save the environment, local businesses in Hoylake are vowing to be sustainable in every way they can. Here is our reporter, Tallulah Solomon, with more. Hoylake has been deemed as an eco-friendly village with many small businesses adapting to a sustainable way of life. McComb's Pet Shop has been using recycled milk containers to make bird feeders. Eco Vegan Shop Chemist & Co is continuing to sell environmentally friendly products. Environmental issues were always something that it's just to me there was no other way of doing it. So when I started making my candles, I started looking at the ingredients and at the products and what is out there and all the perfumes, you know, just making sure that they haven't been tested on animals. That is something that comes almost um, naturally to me that I look into these things. So I always believe the minimal packaging um, and things like that. You just need to have an open mind and be ready to change and um, improve. If we continue to be sustainable, we will create a cleaner and greener future. A last ditch attempt to save an award-winning Merseyside Pony Sanctuary from closure has won support of thousands of people online. The Shy Lowen Horse and Pony Sanctuary has appealed to Sefton Council to extend its lease on its eight acres of land near Bootle. Since it was launched 21 years ago, the centre has provided a safe haven for horses and ponies of all shapes and sizes, giving local children the chance to work with them. But Sefton Council has failed to formalise an agreement to grant the sanctuary a 99-year lease, leaving its future uncertain. Jorge Caparera has the details. These peaceful and jolly animals could become harmless. Sefton Sanctuary for Horses and Ponies Shilohan is lacking financial stability after the lease on the land where it's located ended and closure is an option. We've spent over three years trying to negotiate with Sefton Council who were the landowners to give us a longer lease because we can't get any funding because obviously funders need to you need to be able to prove longevity we need to be able to say we will be here but right now we we don't know ourselves if we'll be here the parties haven't made a greeting agreement yet the charity's closure would hold socialization programs for horses classified as dangerous for the public 
and would start therapy programs for people facing social and health challenges. Because my friends and family have seen what this equine therapy has done for me, they're all on the website and involved in it. It, it's an amazing experience. Sefton Council discussed last Thursday a motion to table by the charity with the support of almost 3,000 signatures. Councillor Podlet Lappent told the council in response to the motion that they actually have been working with Shiloh Lowen for over a year and that they value the work. She said that the latest negotiations were down to the COVID-19 crisis. The council agreed continuing talks with the charity aiming to make substantial progress by the end of the year. However, if the parties can't reach an agreement, Bernadette has already decided to sell her house and invest the money in the sanctuary. Jorge Capera, Liverpool Life. Sport now with our sports editor, Tallulah Solomon. Thanks. So some good COVID news on the footy front. While clubs wait to hear how many fans could be returning to the stands post-lockdown, one man who could be back on the pitch tomorrow is Mo Salah just in time for Liverpool's Champions League clash against Atalanta. Keith Hill will take charge of his first game as Tranmere manager tonight. Rovers host Carlisle United at Prenton Park. Hill was appointed as Rovers' new boss at the weekend. Rugby league now and Warrington have confirmed that Ben Curry, Jason Clark and Max Davis have all extended their contracts with the club. They have also signed a new player, Rob Butler, onto a two-year contract. That's it from the sports desk. For more on these stories, head to www.jmujournalism.com. Back to Beth and Bren Brendan in the studio. Thanks, Tallulah. And finally, we wave goodbye to one of Liverpool's iconic landmarks. The 196-foot tourist attraction is ending its 10-year reign over the Albert Docks. It's being taken down by its Dubai owners much to the relief of some residents who regarded it as an eyesore. As yet, its future is unknown. That's all from us this week. For more, visit the Liverpool Life website. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.